I wish I could be there with you all, some of my favorite friends and colleagues in autism research at UCLA, but I will suffice for, uh, I will be satisfied with being a pre-recorded uh, talking head for you today. And what I'm gonna talk about today is biomarker development to improve clinical research in autism spectrum disorder. Um, one of the, I guess, the odd things about giving an asynchronous presentation is you don't hear your own introduction. So I'll give a really quick one and say that I'm a, a clinical psychologist and I'm active clinically and I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and I do research in autism. And the work that I'll be doing today is really about bridging that divide or trying to bridge that divide. These are the, the, the grants that have funded the research that I'll talk about today or, or groups that I'm involved with or, or that I receive funding from. And I don't see any conflict of interest with the specific content that I'm gonna talk about today. This is what I'd like to talk about. So I, I wanna speak very, very briefly about autism only insofar as the way that I think about studying it uh, in terms of biomarker development. And then I'll talk a little bit about the, the context of biomarker development in autism how we might operationalize biomarkers, what are some scientific and practical considerations that are relevant to autism. And then, then I'll talk a bit about work that I've done over the course of the past, you know, really almost two decades to try to understand one particular biomarker called the N170 event related potential. And then I'll talk about some challenges I see to moving forward and then some strategies to move forward. I'll talk about um, a consortium that I'm involved with, the Autism Biomarkers Consortium for Clinical Trials. And then I'll talk about some nascent work in the lab to try to improve accessibility to some of this research and to make biomarkers more widely applicable on the autism spectrum. So great. So autism, I really don't need to tell this group much about autism. Um, you know, broadly, we know that a few different areas of development are affected in autism, social communication, uh, interest in behavioral flexibility, sensory perception and response. I want to highlight just a few things that are really relevant about autism when you're thinking about biomarker development. First, autism isn't one thing from a biological perspective. There are, are many different causes of autism. There are many different neural mechanisms involved in autism. And so when we think about it in terms of biomarkers, it's really complicated. We're talking about many things. Now, implicit when I say this, that we, we don't really know exactly the mechanisms involved in autism, it's because we're, we're talking about a condition that presently is really purely behaviorally defined. The things that we clinicians see with our eyes, the things that parents can describe to us, this is the way that we understand autism, and this is the way that we make all decisions about autism, whether a diagnosis of autism is appropriate, whether what treatment should be used, whether a treatment is working, all of these things are done with our perceptions of behavior. And you know, to, to, to say that in a strong way, there are no, there is not one biological assay that we can use in autism, to my knowledge, that really has clinical utility. And I think that, that we could do an even better job than we're doing now if we had more biological understanding of autism and more biological tools to inform clinical practice and clinical research of autism. And that is where biomarkers come in. That's why I see biomarkers as such a critical need for our field to advance from where we stand now. Uh, what is a biomarker? Well, a biomarker really um, is just a, a, um, an objective measurement of something that corresponds to a biological process. It really can be a wide diversity of things. And when we think about biomarkers, there's a specific definition and a specific set of categories for their application that's defined by the FDA. And I just wanna highlight a few of these categories and, and tell you how I think about some of the research that I'll talk about today mapping onto them. Um, one category, and, and in FDA parlance, you, you might call this context of use or purpose, but the, the way the FDA calls it is a, is a context of use. One context of use is susceptibility or risk. So in the case of autism, this might tell us for whom uh, autism is a likely outcome in the development. Another category is pharmacodynamic or response. This is telling us that our particular intervention or agent has engaged a specific biological system 
prognostic biomarkers tell us something about the course of development for a person with a particular condition. And relatedly, predictive biomarkers tell us something about the way a person is going to respond to a particular intervention. So these are all different kinds of biomarkers that the FDA defines that could be relevant to autism. I think most of the time in autism, when people think about biomarkers, they think about one thing and they think about a diagnostic biomarker. And even more specifically, they think of it as a biomarker that is diagnostic of the condition, that this is a biomarker that tells us who has autism and who doesn't. And that's a really challenging thing to try to think about in terms of biomarker development. How do we find something biological that corresponds perfectly in this definitional kind of way to something that we, we think is not likely one biological entity? So that's worth pursuing. I don't think we need to, to set the bar even that high to think about a way that this context of use could be applicable and useful in autism. Because a, a diagnostic biomarker could also be diagnostic of a subtype. So if we think about autism as being an extremely heterogeneous condition, perhaps biomarkers could help us understand meaningful subgroups in this diverse group. Maybe biomarkers but could tell us groups that are more biologically homogeneous that may have something in common in terms of their course or may respond to a particular treatment in a certain way. But this is, this is the kind of biomarker that I'm really thinking about when I talk about the work that I'll describe today. I also think this is also a nice example of why biomarkers can be useful even in the context of the excellent kind of clinical practice that we have in autism, because this is a place that we as clinicians have not been successful, right? We, we literally tried it. In DSM-4, we had these clinically based subtypes of autism spectrum disorder, and we couldn't reliably diagnose them. We limited them in DSM-5, but there probably are other ways of meaningfully subgrouping people with autism, but it might have to rely on biology rather than our clinical eyes. When I think, this is moving from the FDA's, um, FDA's thoughts to my thoughts, but when I think about the kinds of things that I want to understand for a biomarker to determine whether it might be useful, there's a few different things. I would want a biomarker to be sensitive to diagnostic status, and I don't mean to contradict what I just said about diagnostic biomarkers. A biomarker might not correspond perfectly to diagnostic demarcations. However, if a biomarker doesn't at least hang together with diagnosis, if people with autism don't you know, look more alike in some way than typically developing people do in some way, it's probably unlikely that biomarker is gonna tell us something really meaningful about the biology of autism. We can think about biomarkers in a more nuanced way than just thinking about diagnostic categories by thinking them mapping onto specific domains of function. For example, we might seek certain biomarkers that tell us something about speech perception, and there might be other biomarkers that tell us something about face perception. And they could both be really relevant and helpful in autism, but they, they might relate to autism in really different ways. Likewise, when we think about the way that biomarkers relate to the phenotype or to, to aspects of function, we want to think about it in a in terms of what they do and don't relate to, to what degree of specificity. And for example, if we had a biomarker that was telling us something about intellectual ability, it would, it would likely correspond with many different domains of function in autism because intellectual disability is gonna impact language, it's gonna impact your social engagement, things like that. However, you might not, if you thought this biomarker could potentially tell you about something about response to treatment, you know, a, a treatment targeting intellectual ability might be really different from a treatment targeting speech. And if you were mistaking the biomarker of one for the other, it wouldn't work in the way that you anticipated. And so I think it's very important to think about what a biomarker is measuring, but also then to understand what it might not be measuring and the specificity of what it does measure. It's important to understand the applicability of a biomarker across development in autism, because when I say autism, it could mean a three-year-old, it could mean a 30-year-old, it could mean a 60-year-old. And, you know, especially for brain-based biomarkers, we expect the brain to really look and function differently in these different stages of development. And so we want to understand whether biomarkers are applicable across this age range, whether we need different batteries of biomarkers for different periods of human development. 
And that's something that is, is nuanced to, to think about. For not for every biomarker, but for the kinds of biomarkers I'll talk about today, which are really functional brain biomarkers, we want to understand how they relate to behavior. For example, if, I, if, I, if we wanted to look at an EEG marker in, in autism and we thought it might be telling us something about the way a person perceives a face, but a person is really uncomfortable wearing an EEG net or a person is not looking at the, the screen in which we're presenting the faces, those latter things that I described might actually provide a more EEG signal than what I, than the experiment that we're trying to do. And so we should understand to what degree behavior during biomarker acquisition is shaping our biomarker measurement. And then lastly, we might want a biomarker that is sensitive to change in clinical status, that as a person changes over time, let's say they, they get a social skills treatment or that we, if their social behavior changes, we might expect these biomarker values to change in proportion. Now, I, I wanna highlight a couple of things. I just, I, I mentioned, you know, a few different ways that we could evaluate a biomarker. A biomarker does not need to meet every one of these standards to be useful, right? This is kind of, I think of like as a universe of possibilities, but you don't, a biomarker doesn't have to do all these things to be useful. And even more so, you might not want a biomarker to do all these things. There are going to be different kinds of attributes that are useful for different contexts of use. A biomarker that we want us to tell something about, you know, a subgroup of autism, maybe we don't want it to change a lot in the face of intervention. Conversely, if we had a biomarker that we thought was gonna tell us something about how a person is doing a treatment, that would be the most important biomarker attribute. And so we need to be thoughtful. And I think a problem in biomarker research in autism is in addition, it's just trying to think about them, people often thinking about them as just, you know, this is a, a replacement for a diagnostic, diagnostic assay, is people really looking at every aspect of a biomarker performance and saying, oh, it didn't do this, or it didn't do that, and thinking it's not going to be useful. But really, there's many, many, many different ways that a biomarker can be useful, depending on the specific context of use. The, the kind of biomarker that I'll talk about today, and there's many, many different viable biomarkers, is EEG. And so I know that there's lots of outstanding EEG research that happens in LA. I won't um, go into great detail, but broadly EEG stands for the electro electroencephalogram. This is electrical brain activity. It's recorded directly from the scalp. We do it with, a, with this kind of net that you can see here, uh, soft rubber pedestals with sponges inside rest on a person, moist sponges rest on a person's head, make contact with the scalp, and then we can directly record the firing of groups of neurons. We in, in generally do two kinds of experiments with EEG, either measuring the brain's idle when a person is doing nothing in particular, ideally resting, or um, it, measuring response to particular perceptual events, like things, sights or sounds that we can make happen in the environment. And we call those event-related potentials in that later latter category. One of the things that's really nice about EEG for, um, for study of autism is it's viable in many, many different kinds of people. It's viable across a wide range of cognitive and developmental levels. As I described the apparatus that we use to collect it, it's non-invasive. It tends to be pretty movement tolerant in terms of at least for over, over across a recording sketch session. And so it's really a useful tool that's accessible in the population of people with autism. And it's also really a practical tool. It's expensive to get an EEG system, but once we have an EEG system, the cost of acquiring data is, is really salt water in a person's time. And it's also really accessible. There is an EEG system in every hospital in the country, and we already use it at the population level for screening for seizures, screening for newborn hearing problems. And so there is, a, you know, it's a, it's a feasible method that could be deployed should something useful be discovered in terms of a practical biomarker for autism. And then lastly, um, for the kinds of things that are really central to understanding some of the things that are challenging for autistic people, you know, which often fall within the name of social behavior communication, EEG is a technology that's really been effective in studying this in, in typical development. And so we have a really nice foundation to try to understand the development of people with autism. Let me show you an example of an ERP, so an event-related potential. So this is something that's extracted from the ongoing EEG signal. And this is one called the N170. 
And this is the brain recognizing a face as a face. When we look at an, an EEG chart like this, we're, we're on the y-axis, we're seeing sig strength of signal measured in, in volts. And you can see negative goes down and positive goes up. And then we're also looking at timing across the x-axis. And you can see this is stuff that's happening really fast. This whole chart is less than a second. Now the N170 is called an N170. It's highlighted here in purple because it's a negative going pattern of activity, the N is for negative, and the 170 is about for milliseconds. It's happening in about 170 milliseconds, which is fast, which is less than two tenths of a second. Now, the oh, coming up on two decades ago now, we, we, we published the first study of the N170 in autism. And uh, what we found is that people with autism showed an N170, but they differed in terms of their timing. Their N170 was slower or, or less efficient. And we think that that's potentially very important at the very first stages of a, a face processing, you know, a set of face processing stages that really yields very, very critical social information. Now, I'm going to talk about a number of studies that we've done since then to understand the N170. And as I do, I'm going to refer back to that list of attributes that I described. So here we're seeing that this is not that def diagnostically definitional. However, we do see a difference that hangs together with diagnostic status. We also wanted to understand how it might relate to behavior that is, um, is relevant to face perception. And so when we did this first study in adolescents and adults, we administered a face recognition test and we found that people with autism, and this has been seen before, people with autism tended to make more mistakes on this face recognition task. And we saw that it was associated with the speed of their N170. So again, we're seeing that this, this potential biomarker is different in autism, and it seems to associate with uh, an aspect of function that is relevant. So then we wondered, well, if we're gonna make this inference that it has something to do with social perception, how can we be sure? Could it really just be telling us that this is a brain that processes things that, it's, that it sees more slowly? And so what we would wanna see is demonstrate that in an area in which people with autism are showing strong performance, we're not seeing any differences in the N170. And so we looked at reading. Uh, it actually turns out that when you learn to, to read the letters of about alphabet, of any alphabet, you actually get an N170 to those letters. And it's, it's different from the face N170 in that it tends to be left lateralized rather than right lateralized. But it gave us an opportunity to try to compare perform neural performance in these two, area, two areas. And, and so what we did is we looked at faces that we'd done before compared to houses and then compared letters to a made up alphabet of pseudo letters. And we wanted to understand is, is that if, if as we thought this is telling us something about social function, then we should see differences here, but not here in autism. But if it's just a, a general perceptual difference, then we would expect to see differences in both areas. And we also thought here, well, if we've seen this in adolescents and adults, here's an opportunity to see if it's relevant to a younger cohort. And so this study was conducted in school age children. Now, when we did the first half of this experiment, really replicating what we had done before, we saw the same pattern of results. People with autism made more mistakes on a face recognition task we saw that their N170 was, was slower. So we're seeing the same things we saw before, which is what we'd want, but we're also then seeing developmental relevance, that this delay that we'd seen in adolescents and adults is also consistent in school-aged children. When we looked at the non-social areas of performance, we saw a very different picture. In terms of reading words and in terms of decoding phonemes, people with autism uh, were right in the average range, were just like typically developing participants. And we saw, in terms of brain activity, we didn't see these delays that we had seen for faces. In fact, the only difference that we saw in the brains of the autistic people were that um, they tended to use right hemisphere regions more often involved in face processing more than the people who didn't have autism. So we can make an inference here about the potential specificity. This N170 is not just an index of general perceptual efficiency, but is really telling us something specifically about efficiency in the social domain. The next thing we wanted to understand was how the, the act of acquiring these data might influence these data. And what we did, we specifically, we know that autistic people often look less to the eyes. 
And we also know that the N170 is modulated by where you look on the face. And if you look at the eyes, you tend to have a faster N170. And so perhaps these differences that we're seeing are just telling us that when we sit people down and do an experiment, autistic people look less at the eyes. And so their N170 is slower. And that's fine, that's meaningful. However, then we don't need to really bother with an EEG, do we? We could just be using the eye tracking. And so what we wanted to understand is when the same information is getting to the retina, do we still see these, these differences in neural efficiency? And so what we did was we, we did an experiment where we primed attention to the eyes, to the nose, and to the mouth, and then look at how, looked at how that affected neural response. And what we found is that it didn't really make a difference in autism, that their response was slower on average, as we'd seen in prior experiments. And when we, when we directed attention to the eyes, as you can see here, it wasn't like that brought their, their response time into the same range as the people who didn't have autism. We did see, as we predicted, that the typically developing people would show a faster response, but it was only in them. And so we can infer from this is that when everybody's looking at the stimuli in the same way, we're still seeing the slowed N170. And so they're not just an artifact of gaze behavior. The last thing I want to say, and this is, is really preliminary data, um, this was to try to understand how the, the N170 might relate to changes in clinical status. Pivotal response treatment is a, is a behavioral treatment, kind of a play-based treatment designed to teach children with autism a set of skills that they can then apply to derive more pleasure from interpersonal interaction in the course of play. And a colleague here at Yale Pampantola was, was running a, a PRT treatment. And what we did is we looked at N170 on kids when they were coming into the treatment and when they were coming out of the treatment. And all the kids, um, you know, parents of the kids reported more sociability as a result of the treatment. And what we saw is that their, in, that their N170 latency got faster as well. And so you can see here, each line represents a child and you can see this downward slope for all but two of the children is showing us that at the, at the post recording after they had treatment, their N170 is faster. And I, as you can see here, there's seven children in the study. So really preliminary, but also exciting and provocative from my perspective in terms of another potential application of the N170. So um, again, going back to our, our, our list, the N170 seems there's suggestive evidence that it changes with clinical status. So if we run down all the things that I've talked about, the things that I would wanna know about a biomarker, it's sensitive to diagnostic status, it's associated with function in a specific way, it's relevant across development, it's robust to variation in behavior, it's potentially sensitive to change in clinical status. And then one thing I didn't really emphasize, but I mentioned in passing, is it's a technology that could be used. It's viable in populations with special needs, it's cost effective, and it's accessible. So we've got a lot going in its favor, but we're not there yet, and why not? Well, first I wanna highlight, this is not a story unique to the N170. There's strong evidence for many bio, potential biomarkers for autism, but there are a few problems. One is there's limited reproducibility. I, I show at the bottom of the slide all the studies since our first study that have looked at the N170, and on average, they tend to find what we find, but not everyone does. And we don't know what that means. That could just be another example of heterogeneity in autism. Maybe this is not true of everyone. It could also be a problem with the studies. There's many of these are small studies with limited statistical powers, and there's tremendous variance in the methodolo methodology of the studies and also the rigor of the methodologies. There are, there are also bigger problems with interpreting biomarker research in autism. One, for most biomarkers, we don't know much about reliability or practice effects, and we don't have anything to compare them to, to values to, in, on average. Average. For example, if, you know, if we were interested in measuring head circumference, we could download CDC growth charts to see what's the head size you would expect for a three-year-old. But we can't do that for an N170. And so all of these kinds of limitations are addressable. They just need a different kind of study. We need more rigorous studies. And ideally, we need to be able to take these to a place where the FDA could deem the evidence that exists as worthy of a biomarker being qualified to be used in clinical trials. And these considerations are really what, uh, what brought the ABCCT into being now almost six years ago. The ABCCT, the Autism Biomarkers Consortium for Clinical Trials is a, is a large biomarker study. 
based here at Yale involves other sites, uh, including, you know, during the first phase, UCLA, and during this next coming phase, CHLA. There were 399 children involved in the study, school-aged children with a, an IQ range spanning uh, mild to moderate intellectual disability and well above average. We used EEG and eye tracking, uh, implemented with a very, very high level of rigor, and we picked those those methods because of the, some of the reasons I described before, because they're practically viable assays. And then we used a longitudinal design, really to, to let us look at reliability in the short term from baseline to six weeks to a longer term from baseline to 24 weeks. Now, I, I'm not gonna go through all the measures on this next slide, so don't be overwhelmed, but I just wanna flash this up here to say, we really did the, the kind of the, the range of clinical, rating forms and parent report measures that represent the state of the art in terms of clinical assessment in autism. And then we administered a biomarker battery really designed to draw upon those that have shown the most promise in many, many years of prior studies. You can see an asterisk, and that means this is apparently actually harmonized with a, another consortium taking place in Europe. So the op opportunity to both kind of analyze results in a in a mega sample, but then also to replicate one another. And you can see that the N170 that I've talked so much about today was one of the biomarkers that we designated as primary in this study. To be brief, you know, we, we don't have time to go through all the results, but in terms of the N170, we, we saw what we predicted. The N170 latency was slower in people with autism. We, we learned new things. We learned that it's fairly reliable. So we see a, 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 an interclass correlation coefficient of 0.66 over the short term, a little bit lower over the longer term. And then we saw things that we'd seen before in terms of the relationship to the phenotype, specifically a relationship with face memory and also predictive value in terms of estimating what face memory would be 24 weeks down the line. You know, I just wanna highlight really quickly in this histogram that, and this is part of the issue that, that I described before, this is not gonna be a diagnostic test for autism. If we see the people with autism shown in green and the typically developing kids shown in blue, we can see that many, many overlap. But what's interesting to us is this tail of the distribution where the values reflect um, you know, something that's really almost exclusively true of autistic people. So this study concluded in 2019. And since then, a number of really positive things have happened. We submitted this N170 marker and another marker to the FDA's biomarker qualification program. And both were accepted, which is a first for the field of autism and a first for the field of psychiatry. We have a very, very long way to go, but we're really excited to have made it to, to this stage or continue working with the FDA to see if these could be useful. Um, the way we've described it is as a diagnostic biomarker, but in that more nuanced way, not as a diagnostic biomarker of autism, but that these markers might tell us something about uh, a group, a, a strata, a stratum within the field, within this really heterogeneous group of people with autism that then could be used in the context of clinical trials to improve our analytic power by really focusing on this group. We've actually received additional grants from the FDA to follow up on development of biomarker qualification plans. And we actually this coming, well, today is April 4th. I don't know what day you're watching this, but on April 11th, we're slated to have our next conversation with the FDA, really to think about this and to work on our biomarker qualification plan. And it's, it's a, a complicated and really interesting area in that because there is not a precedent established, we are, um, really kind of working with the FDA to establish how you should solve some of these really thorny problems. How, how do you use the existing data to support a specific context of use? How do we draw thresholds and then validate them in a continuous distribution? And how do we make sure that the methods applied in this really, really rigorous study are applicable in other contexts? We are, our work is ongoing. We were renewed in July, 2020. Right now, we are in the midst of a follow-up study to reevaluate that phase one original cohort of 399 kids, two and a half to four years after enrollment. We um, are about to start actually this month, a confirmation study in which we'll repeat that first study in a new cohort of 400 children. And then the third part of this renewal is going to be to conduct a feasibility study to see whether these measures could be viable in younger children, three to five year old children. I want to close by mentioning very quickly a different kind of research. So the, the ABCC 
CT really represents an effort to take biomarkers that have shown great promise to get them over the hurdle into some degree of clinical research utility. But we also believe in innovating new ways uh, of acquiring and understanding biomarkers. And this is work done in the lab led by Adam Naples. And really one of the problems that we recognize in our work is there's a huge portion of the spectrum really left untouched by this research. And those that, that is the group of people with significant intellectual disability. And so some of the work that Adam's doing is trying to build new ways of acquiring biomarker data that we hope can make the process more accessible, more pleasant, uh, or at least more um, you know, tolerable for people who may have greater sensory reactions, who may understand less the language we're using to, um, to, 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 to guide a person through the process. And so I, I don't have time to get into all the details, but basically the idea is to, to build a setup with eye tracking, with head monitoring, with chair monitoring, that basically instead of telling people what not to do, we um, let them know that the, 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 the more relaxed they are during an EEG recording, the more of their favorite videos they're gonna get, get, gonna get to see. And in principle, it's working so far. So we're really succeed, seeing successful acquisition of, um, of eye tracking and EEG data. You can see here kind of proof of concept data showing that we're getting an N170 that's bigger to faces, that we're seeing um, differences in patterns of attention to faces. And we're really able to do this now effectively in people with a really, really wide range of intellectual ability. And I'll stop there. Um, I, I wanna thank a few groups, most importantly, the, um, the children, the autistic adults, their families that come in and work with us, um, the clinicians in the Developmental Disabilities Clinic at Yale, which is really our, our first and, and most important um, interaction with the community. The Autism Biomarker Consortium for Clinical Trials, here just a subset of some of the leadership across the consortium is displayed. And then lastly, the, the group in the lab that does a lot of the work that I've described to you today. I, uh, I thank you so much again for the opportunity to talk to you about this work that I'm so excited about. I don't know exactly how this asynchronous presentation is gonna work, but I hope that I'm able to talk about this with you and maybe to, uh, to field some questions, but thank you so much.